We'll come to order. Uh, today, the Trade Subcommittee is holding a hearing on the United States-Japan Trade Agreement. The subject of today's hearing with Japan's partial agreement with the United States has significant consequences for one of our largest trading partners, a strategic ally, and a country with whom we've had, as our witnesses might attest, a, a complicated trading <laughs> relationship. It's also important to note that the United States has assumed a much reduced role with trade relationships with Japan and Asia. While Trump sidelined the United States with TPP, Japan and the other 10 countries move on, concluding a comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which went into effect last year. Japan also concluded a comprehensive FTA with the EU 10 months ago, and it's currently engaged in a regional comprehensive economic partnership with 14 other countries, including China, hoping to finalize a deal soon. This is the context in which we are evaluating this partial agreement. This is also a significant time in the relationship between Congress and this administration. As you know, we've been working productively resolving differences over NAFTA 2.0 um, with the administration. Their process with Japan and Congress is troubling. 
Over a year ago, USTR notified Congress of its intent to enter into this agreement, but it would do so only based on consultation with Congress. Consultation, which as near as I can tell, did not occur. This is despite the fact that the TPA requires the USTR to notify and consult before, during, and upon completion of trade agreements. Sadly, the USTR ignored our repeated request for meaningful consultation while negotiations with Japan were ongoing. What consultation did occur was perfunctory and after the fact. It's telling that in September, USTR had a last-minute weekend telephone call to staff of both parties uh, to assure this bipartisan staff that there was no deal, while simultaneously the president announced an agreement had been achieved in principle. Curious. While Congress has had virtually no role, the Japanese Diet has been considering the agreement for the last two weeks, and I'm told that the lower house has already approved it going forward. The administration even declined our request to appear before the committee with us today to have this long overdue discussion. Nevertheless, we will move forward, helping to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S.-Japan trade agreement and the U.S.-Japan digital trade agreement. We need to evaluate how the rest of the TPA objectives outlined in December are pursued. There are implications for picking low-hanging fruit. I mentioned earlier some of this is literally picking it up the, off the ground, not low-hanging, uh, for initial trade agreements and deferring the tough subjects for later. And there are certainly difficult elements of the trade relationship with Japan that we need to address. There are also implications, as Congressman Kine reminds us, for the WTO and its central tenet of most favored nation treatment if the United States and other countries increasingly negotiate agreements that cut tariffs for a limited array of products. We may be undermining the core principle of multinationalism, multilateralism. The relationship between the USTR and Congress going forward, the implications of negotiating partial agreements, um, and the challenges to WTO rules of trade are all important areas to explore as we examine one of the most important trading relationships in the world at a critical time in international trade, especially relating to Asia. And we have a distinguished panel here who can help us explore it. I look forward to hearing from our witness to elaborate on these and other items. Let me defer to Ranking Member Buchanan for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Japan is one of the most important trading partners, and I'm pleased to discuss the tremendous wins for U.S. companies that the administration has achieved. Through our new agreements, as well as the opportunity to improve our access to customers in Japan through a comprehensive agreement, um, Japan is one of the top trading partners. Its GDP ranks third behind only the United States and China. The United States and Japan combined account for over 30 percent of the GDP globally. U.S. goods and services trade with uh, Japan totally nearly $300 billion last year. Japan is the fourth largest market for U.S. goods and third largest for U.S. agriculture. U.S. exporters are successful in Japan, but there are many challenges. I commend the President Trump and Ambassador Lighthouser for negotiating new agreements to address significant trade barriers and modernize our relationship. Their success is particularly important for many of our farmers and ranchers who are now at a huge disadvantage to major competitors like Australia, Canada, EU, Mexico, because they have trade deals with Japan that exclude us. This initial agreement is a major win for our farmers and ranchers. When we implement this deal in January, we'll be leveling the playing field for most of our ag exports by matching the tariff rates enjoyed by TPP countries. Over 90 percent of the U.S. food and ag exports to Japan will either be duty-free or receive better access in January. We'll see results quickly because the tariffs changes uh, can be implemented without a congressional vote through a narrow and exclusive authority for tariff only that Congress uh, delegated to the administration and TPA. 
Digital trade agreements uh, is valuable to high-tech companies as well as every sector of our economy, including manufacturing, service providers, agribiz, uh, because digital trade is essential to efficiency and serving customers worldwide. This agreement ensures free flow of data, prohib prohibits any data service, Localization ensures non-discriminatory treatment of digital products, including taxation. I'm enthusiastic about these initial deals with Japan, but while we recognize the benefits for farmer and industry, we rely on a free flow of data. We have to press for more. We agree with USTR and Japan that we need a complete, comprehensive, high-standard agreement that levels the playing field for U.S. workers and companies in all sectors of our economy. I can pen... I, uh, uh, excited about Ambassador Lighthizer for settled, setting uh, forth detailed negotiation objectives for a comprehensive agreement in 2018. We must move promptly to complete this agreement. As these negotiations uh, proceed next year, we look forward to partnering with the administration through improved, robust, and freak, uh, frequent consultation with Congress as required by TPA. Finally, as we push forward with Japan, Congress has a crucial opportunity to access new customers and modernization trade rules with our closest trading partners here in North America. US, USMCA is a high standard and comprehensive agreement that I'm proud to support. My home state of Florida annually exports over $12 billion worth of goods and services to Canada and Mexico, supporting over 700,000 jobs. USMCA updates these uh, deep trade relationships and make sure they work for all Americans. I'm confident there, there will be a strong bipartisan support. I look forward to voting for this this year. Every day we delay has real costs for U.S. jobs and growth. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I want to all thank all of our witnesses for being here today as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Buchanan. Uh, if I may just exercise a, a point of personal privilege, uh, David Skillman, uh, our Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief Counsel uh, has played, uh, I think, a critical role not just in my office, but with uh, interacting with Ways and Means staff uh, for the last 12 years. Uh, this is his last week uh, with us. Uh, David, thank you for your contributions uh, on both sides of the aisle, uh, somebody who's respected for his hard work and even-handedness, and you will be missed. Now, uh, turning to our distinguished panel of witnesses uh, to discuss uh, the agreement, I would like to first welcome Darcy Vetter, the Global Lead of Public Affairs and Vice Chair of Agriculture and Food at Edelman U.S. Public Affairs. Uh, following Ms. Vetter is Matthew Goodman, Senior Vice President, Simon Chair in Political Economy, and Senior Advisor for Asian Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Then we'll hear from Josh Nasser. Nasser, Mr. Nasser is the Legislative Director for United Auto Workers. And finally, we will hear from Russell Boehning, the owner of Loma Vista Farms and Boning Brothers Dairy, Inc., and the president of the Texas Farm Bureau. Welcome to you all. There's more information about their distinguished biographies uh, in the material. Um, we would have... Uh, let you know that each of your statements will be entered into the record. If you could summarize your testimony, some of it would be a little longer than five minutes. We'd ask you to hold it to five minutes or less. And to help with that, there's a, a timer in front of you to help you keep track. When you have one minute left, the light will switch from green to yellow, and finally to red when the five minutes have. Ambassador Vetter, welcome. You may begin. Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the U.S.-Japan trade agreement. This agreement is critical for U.S. agriculture to remain competitive in the Japanese market and will provide a much-needed boost for U.S. agricultural exports. U.S. agriculture is struggling. Several years of low commodity prices have stretched farmers thin, while catastrophic flooding has impacted this year's harvest. At the same time, farmers are being squeezed by tariffs on steel and aluminum imports on one side and retaliatory tariffs on U.S. ag exports on the other. Together, these factors have contributed to a 16% decrease in net farm income in 2018. In this context, the U.S.-Japan agreement could not come soon enough. Japan is currently our third largest agricultural export market, 
But over the past few years, Japan has concluded trade deals with some of our strongest competitors, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand through the CPTPP, as well as with the EU. Without our own agreement in place, these countries will undermine U.S. market share in Japan, a process that is already evident in this year's export numbers. The U.S.-Japan agreement can reverse this trend. It provides broad benefits across the agricultural sector and would immediately bring the tariffs paid by U.S. producers to the same level as those faced by CPTPP and EU countries. The agreement provides a substantial majority of the benefits that would have been provided had the United States remained in TPP. While the agreement is undoubtedly a positive for U.S. agriculture, it is important to remember what this agreement is and what it isn't. It is a critical opportunity to ensure that U.S. ag does not fall behind its competitors. It is not, however, a free trade agreement in the traditional sense and may not be the appropriate model for opening markets in other countries. For starters, the agreement does not cover all ag products. Key exclusions include rice, butter, milk powders, lamb and sheep meat, fresh poultry, and a wide variety of horticulture products. Given the breadth and depth of U.S. ag export interests, these exclusions are important, not only because those products won't gain new access to Japan, but also because these exclusions may be seen as a signal that the U.S. is willing to exclude products in future deals. This deal does not provide the structure to alleviate non-tariff barriers that our other more comprehensive agreements do. Food safety and animal, plant, animal and plant health regulations, when improperly applied, can become barriers that are far more restrictive than tariffs. In addition to being a major agricultural producer, the United States also excels in the provision of agricultural services and technologies. All of these concerns point to the importance of concluding a phase two of this agreement. Any second phase should augment the existing tariff provisions with a robust chapter on SPS, services, and intellectual property, and should provide market access for those products not currently covered. Finally, we cannot overlook the fact that the context for the U.S.-Japan agreement was unique. Most provisions of this agreement had already been agreed, and in the case of Japan, voted upon, as part of the TPP process. Further, the tariff concessions granted by Japan have already been implemented with multiple other trading partners. But agriculture is typically a very politically sensitive sector. And given this sensitivity, if we were to pursue a phased agreement with other countries, it is unlikely that agriculture would be the first sector across the finish line. Many trade agreements already contain a lot of exceptions to full market opening for agriculture. A phased approach would provide yet another opportunity for delay. While this agreement allowed us to grab some low-hanging fruit for U.S. ag, with other countries, the low-hanging fruit might not include any actual fruit or meat, dairy, grains, or wine. In summary, the U.S.-Japan agreement is an important step forward with a leading trade partner at a critical time. But it is not a substitute for a more comprehensive agreement or a structure that, if replicated, is likely to be advantageous for U.S. agriculture. The United States should seek a more comprehensive agreement with Japan as part of any second phase negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee. Thank you for this chance to offer my thoughts on the recently signed U.S.-Japan trade agreements. In my view, uh, the agreements with Japan are a step in the right direction, but only a step. Uh, there are broadly three things to like about the agreements and three where uh, they fall short. On the plus side, uh, the main agreement levels the playing field for many agricultural products in Japan, which lost ground to Australia, Canada, and others when tariff cuts started to take effect under CPTPP, the successor to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, after the United States withdrew from TPP early in the Trump administration. Second, the digital trade agreement advances U.S. preferred rules in this critical area of today's economy by, among other things, prohibiting customs duties on e-commerce, ensuring the free flow of data across borders, and preventing data localization. And third, the deal allows the United States and Japan to focus on other priorities in their relationship, notably managing the challenges of a more assertive China. 
The three main shortcomings are first, that this mini deal leaves a lot on the table, including agriculture concessions that Japan made in TPP and an array of other longstanding trade issues between the United States and Japan, notably in the automotive sector. Second, there are questions about the mini deal's consistency with Congress's grant of trade promotion authority and with the WTO requirement that such deals cover, quote, substantially all the trade, unquote, between the parties. And finally, this mini deal fails to maximize the potential of the US-Japan economic relationship. The United States and Japan are the first and third largest economies in the world, and they are aligned on most of the rules governing the global trading system. We don't agree on everything. U.S. exporters and investors have long found the Japanese market very hard to penetrate because of market access barriers and regulatory challenges in Japan. But for decades, Washington and Tokyo have worked together to defend and uphold an open, transparent, rules-based international order. We've been partners in regional and global institutions, from APEC to the IMF, in supporting existing rules and norms and creating new ones. At a time when the global order is under stress, particularly from new challengers like China, there is more need than ever for the United States and Japan to work together to ensure that our preferred rules and norms prevail. This was the power of TPP, which established new rules not only in the digital space, but on state-owned enterprises, regulatory practices, procurement, and many other areas. We could try to recreate some of these rules bilaterally with Japan via second stage negotiations toward a comprehensive FTA. But this will require a lot of time and political capital, and frankly, I'm skeptical that either side will make it a priority, at least next year. In parallel with, or instead of, bilateral talks, I think U.S. interests would be well served by indicating our intention to rejoin CPTPP. In addition to the economic benefits, this would bring a strong signal to our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region at a time when they are questioning our commitment there. It would also send an important signal to China. Beyond trade, there's a lot of work to be done with Japan in other areas of rulemaking and standard setting. These include infrastructure, where Prime Minister Abe's efforts at the uh, last June's Osaka G20 summit to broker a set of principles on quality infrastructure offered a valuable response to China's Belt and Road Initiative. CSIS issued a report late last year in which we identified other areas for economic cooperation with Japan and the region. We called it the Article II mandate after the second article, not the 22nd, the second article of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, which reaches its 60th anniversary next year. Article II says that the United States and Japan will, quote, seek to eliminate conflict in their international economic policies and will encourage economic collaboration between them. The trade deal we're discussing today is a step toward that objective, but there's a long way to go. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, first of all, I want to just uh, state that our one million members and retirees are highly dependent on the success of the domestic auto industry, not just people that are working at plants, but also retirees and their families. So this is an issue that we paid very close attention to for a very long time. Um, we think the stage one uh, is a mistake. And the reason why is because um, the idea of it trading industrial goods for ag access um, could, set a ver could be really bad for, frankly, industrial workers. And I hear a lot about how auto and auto parts are excluded. That's true on official tariff lines. But when you dig deeper, there's a lot of tier three suppliers that have parts that are in automobiles, ultimately, that are having tariffs eliminated. Um, also, concerned about uh, the precedent of, of any president going ahead and um, just reducing tariffs um, without a more uh, robust process with Congress. I think that's, that's dangerous. Um, so this whole idea of trying to get into Japan's market is not new when it comes to automobiles. The truth is that um, over 77% of our trade deficit with the Japanese is in autos. 
Japan has the, the most closed market in the developed world on automobiles, less than 7% imports, okay? U.S., by comparison, over 50% imports. So when you look at this, why does Japan keep such a closed market? How does that happen? Well, one is they have a long history of intervening in the currency markets. Um, I've seen records say, saying it's been, you know, hundreds of times. And what I mean is they intentionally have, have exercised monetary policy which lowers the value of their, which makes their products cheaper and ours more expensive. So a uh, car for getting import from Japan has a, immediately a pretty significant price advantage. Uh, currency manipulation is not tackled in this stage one. We think that, it, you know, that's a key part of any agreement with, with Japan or any other country, frankly. We also think that uh, it's important to, to address labor standards. Um, you know, our trade model in general, we would contend, has not worked for working people um, and our membership. And we think that um, we need a more, uh, you know, model that actually puts worker rights in the forefront. Also want to point out that uh, Japanese automakers that are in the United States, um, well, a couple things. One, if tariffs are eliminated, because we have tariffs on Japanese autos, but they have none on ours, and yet we still have this enormous trade deficit. Um, it could, over time, create an less of an incentive for companies to uh, build those cars in the United States because the tariff is a uh, motivates some of the uh, investments in the United States, especially in light truck, where it's 25%. Um, the other thing, though, is uh, unfortunately, Japanese uh, auto companies, by and large, have had really um, anti-labor practices in the United States. They, there's a long history of... Uh, fighting workers' efforts to join together. Um, we have seen, you know, um, a history of a large use of a temp workforce um, and other things like that. And we think that, you know, labor rights has to be t tackled here. And by the way, most of, uh, for, let's say, uh, Nissan, they have 45 plants in the world. 42 are unionized. Guess which three aren't? Three in the United States. So finally, just wanted to say that... Uh, when looking at this agreement, um, we think the whole idea of trading ag access for access to one market um, is not a great way to go. We think you got to, if you're going to do it, look at the whole thing. And now some people will say there's been efforts made, again, to open Japan's market, but they have, it's not just currency manipulation, they have a labyrinth of um, non-tariff barriers that not just U.S. companies, by the way, have, have failed to penetrate. So we think if you really want to get serious about reducing the auto trade deficit with Japan, it would take things like limiting, actually, Japanese uh, auto imports here uh, through quotas and such. That's how you would actually do it. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that this is, this is a critical issue for auto workers. This is something that we've you know, been tracking for a long time. By the way, our members depend on trade. We, we rely on good trade agreements, and um, we, we need trade in order to have uh, good jobs, but this is not that. And finally, we're very sympathetic with um, agricultural communities. We have a lot of members who uh, build ag equipment, for example, who, have, who are, are hurting. So it's nothing about uh, no negative thoughts there. So anyway, look forward to answering your questions. Thanks for your time. Good morning, everyone. Chairman Boonhauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Russell Banning. My family and I live near Polk, Texas. Um, no one knows where that is. That's about 35 miles southeast of San Antonio. We make our living farming and ranching. We have a dairy. We have a beef cattle operation. We grow wheat, cotton, feed grains, and watermelons. I currently serve as president of Texas Farm Bureau and on the American Farm Bureau Federation Board of Directors, and I chair their trade advisory committee. International trade plays a critical role in the success of our U.S. economy. We as farmers and ranchers see the benefits of trade daily as we work to plant, grow, harvest, and especially to market our products. In 2018, U.S. food and ag products totaled a staggering $145 billion and supported more than 1 million jobs. U.S. farmers and ranchers export nearly $13 billion a year of ag products to Japan, making it our third largest market which has been pointed out. Coming a little bit closer to home, trade with Japan is extremely important to my home state. In 2018, Texas exported more than $216 million worth of beef products, $35 million worth of grain sorghum, 
and over 2.4 million in pork and dairy products. Bringing that close to our operation, dairy, beef, and grain sorghum are the three most important products on our farm. So as you can see, trade with Japan is vitally important. We have a strong trading relationship with Japan currently. We think we're about to make substantial advances. The new U.S. The new US Japan trade agreement was welcome news for farm and ranch families across the entire country. This agreement will help level the Japanese trade playing field and open markets around the world for American farm and ranch families. It does help keep some of the trade benefits that we would have gained under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we do understand that there's more work to be done there. According to the USDA, of the $14.1 billion in U.S. Food Act products imported by Japan, $5.2 billion were already duty-free. Japan, under this agreement, Japan will eliminate or reduce tariffs on an additional $7.2 billion of U.S. food and ag products. I'm proud that this agreement will help Texas and U.S. beef producers. Implementation will allow our country to obtain market access equal to the CP-TPP countries. Tariffs for fresh chilled and frozen beef will reduce from 38% to 9%. I made a comment earlier to some folks in a, in a private meeting Several years ago, I went to Japan with a group of producers. They do want our beef. They want, they want U.S. beef. They want Texas beef. So we really look, for, look at this as a win. It is our, at currently our largest export market for, part, for pork. And that, that uh, market should grow as well from $1.6 billion to more than $2.2 billion over the next 15 years. It's our fifth largest export market for dairy products. Japan's 40% cheese tariffs will be eliminated over 15 years. Tariffs will be immediately eliminated on over $1.3 billion of U.S. farm products, including almonds, blueberries, cranberries, sweet corn, grain sorghum, and more. And for other products, tariffs will be eliminated over several years, which includes wine, ethanol, frozen poultry, processed pork, and more. It's obvious that this agreement is a win. However, it's been pointed out, and we agree we must pursue the next phase of negotiations with Japan. Not all ag products, such as rice and some other dairy products, were included in this, in this agreement. We must work toward market ac additional market access. Sanitary, final sanitary, and biotech issues should also be addressed. So as farm and ranch families face much uncertainty, we think a fully comprehensive trade agreement with Japan is desperately needed. We appreciate the administration and other leaders in, in Congress in Washington to continue striving for a more free and fair trade. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, I'd like to uh, be, uh, mention USMCA. This agreement is very, very important to U.S. Ag. We think it must be ratified now. It would tremendously benefit U.S. farmers just to move forward uh, with this agreement and many other sectors of the uh, economy as well. I truly believe that many of our trading partners are looking at USMCA and waiting for us to get a deal done with our neighbors. I urge congressional leaders to take action on this agreement. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Nasser. in uh, your verbal testimony, you gave a statistic that wasn't in your written testimony about, is it Nissan? Uh, yeah, yes, Nissan. They have 40, 45 plants worldwide and 42 are unionized. The three that aren't are in the United States. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goodman, uh, as has been mentioned by the ranking member, Japan is the world's third largest economy. Um, it's our fourth largest trading and investment partner. And our trade policies are largely aligned. This negotiation presented an opportunity to codify and capitalize on those shared practices. However, the administration has decided to pursue this negotiation in stages. This is the first time that the USTR has notified the Congress for a comprehensive FTA negotiation and returned with a deal that does not achieve most of the objectives. How difficult will it be for the USTR to achieve a second stage of negotiations that actually fulfill those objectives. What does this staging approach mean for the future of FTA negotiations generally? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I think it's going to be very difficult to um, 
to reach a second stage agreement with Japan, um, at least in the near term. If, if the objective is to do this within this um, term of the Trump administration, I think it's going to be very difficult in practice because TPA, um, FTA negotiations are, as you know well, very complex and rarely can be done you know, that quickly in any case. Um, although we have agreed to many of this, the, um, the chapters of what would be in a comprehensive FTA with Japan through our agreement in TPP, um, there have been, uh, there were some issues on which the U.S. and Japan did not agree, and at the margin, those are going to be important differences that are going to have to be worked out. I think Japan is also reluctant to move into a full-bore FTA. Um, they, um, they've always been reluctant. I think they've been much more inclined to have the United States rejoin TPP, and they started trying to persuade the administration of that and realized that they weren't going to succeed, so they stopped advocating for that explicitly, but that's still their objective. And I think they think that the two things are inconsistent. I'm not actually sure they are. I think, in theory, you could do both, even though it's a lot of work. But, but, um, uh, but beyond that, in terms of the broader implications for trade policy, um, I think uh, this, is, this is a suboptimal approach. It would be better to do these things in one bite. I'm also, though, a pragmatist, and I think there were some real issues that had to be addressed, including the agriculture ones. And I think, uh, I think you know, as a former policymaker, I'd say there are times when you have to make the best of what you've got, but I, but I do think, in principle, we should be working for something bigger, and I think it should be a broader regional agreement like TPP. Well, I, I appreciate your cautionary notes, and Ambassador, uh, you referenced things like rice that has still hanging out there, uh, and less likely that we have the uh, incentive, the motivation, and the reciprocal activity on the other side. Uh, I would like to uh, pursue further um, just the, the notion in terms of this bigger picture. In October, the USTR notified Congress of its intent to enter into a free trade agreement negotiations with Japan. In December, they released comprehensive negotiating objectives consistent with TPA. They specifically stated that while it might seek to pursue negotiations with Japan in stages, it would do so only based on consultation with Congress. Those consultations never happened. As members of the trade advisory committees or former trade negotiators, can you reflect on the traditional model of consultation and what took place uh, uh, in work that you were involved with and any differences that took place in that negotiation? Ambassador, can we start with you and uh, move down the line here? Um, I'd be happy to reflect a bit on the consultation process in negotiating the ag package for TPP. Uh, I think that uh, in that instance, frequent conversations, both with Congress and with stakeholders, were extremely helpful in being able to achieve an agreement that maximized value for the sector. Uh, Japan did not make negotiation of an ag agreement easy. Uh, instead of dealing with full categories of products, saying how would we treat beef or pork, for example, um, we really negotiated that line by line and product by product. And so using those uh, contacts with stakeholders and with Congress to understand the relative value of individual products within categories allowed us then to craft an agreement that would um, allow U.S. agriculture to benefit uh, the most, to time those trade concessions, to structure quotas or safeguards in a way that would be most advantageous to the United States. And so uh, that negotiation, I really consider uh, a partnership uh, with U.S. industry and with the Hill. Uh, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I've read the Constitution, and uh, I think Article 1, Section 8 uh, makes clear who's in charge here. Uh, so I do think um, that uh, consultation with Congress is essential, uh, and certainly in my experience, that was always part of the uh, part of the process. I think picking up on something um, Ambassador Vetter said, uh, it actually is very helpful to an administration to consult with Congress, both for getting substantive input and sort of political support. But I'd say back in the day, um, 
you guys were kind of the bad cop. The administration was the good cop and could say, you know, personally I abhor violence, but as for Igor here, I can't speak for, for her. Um, that was uh, what your role was, and it was quite helpful. So I, I think consultation is very important, and if it didn't happen in this case, then I think it should have. Uh, yeah, I, I serve on uh, several committees, ACPIN, LAC, et cetera. And I, and I got to say the LAC, which is the Labor Advisory Committee, uh, we didn't have um, formal consultation while these terms were getting negotiated. There were the advisory committees did have an opportunity to, to comment on proposals right before they went out the door. By the way, we weren't allowed to talk about it to anyone. Um, but that, in, in our view, is not meaningful consultation. Also, it's not, I don't want to slight the hardworking men and women who work for USTR and Department of Commerce, but the process was really not good on this one. Ben, you have any observations, even though you may not have negotiated them? You were. Uh, I, mean, I don't know about exactly. I, I guess there, there there wouldn't be any disagreement from us that consultation is important with Congress. I, I think I just one thing I don't think I pointed out in my testimony, and maybe this is my opportunity. From Ag's per perspective, it was just we needed a win. We needed a, it was a critical. You know, the word critical has been used several times uh, uh, from in different perspectives, and and uh, so we you know we we were looking for a win from uh, whether it you know it comes from Japan, whether it comes from China. Uh, whether it comes from USMCA, which comes from any of those areas. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, hopefully as we move forward, uh, uh, that can get worked out. But, uh, uh, again, we, we just needed to win on that. And I appreciate you providing uh, that contextual statement. Uh, what we're doing with this hearing is to try and understand the cost of a short-term win for long-term problems, including things like advancing agricultural interests uh, with the tough ones. But I appreciate you uh, uh, making that point. It's, it's important, and that's why we're pleased that you're here. Uh, Mr. Buchanan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's no question we've got a, you know, a good working relationship in general, but there's a lot of work to be done. It's going to be complicated. I was a young person trying to do business in Japan many years ago, market asset. Accessing that market was a big issue. So there's, so I think you kind of said, uh, Mr. Goodman, a little bit. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to get the low-hanging fruit. Maybe it's not the perfect way to go, but farmers and ranchers are somewhat at risk. If you listen to all the stories, and uh, someone mentioned one time, you know, work on getting a half a loaf, get that done, then work on the other half. But uh, Mr. Bain, let me ask you. Uh, to break it down, you know, you're a fourth generation rancher farmer uh, in terms of your family business, which I think is pretty exceptional. I just love to see your, you know, generational businesses like that. What does that mean to businesses like yourself in this environment if we didn't get it done? I mean, we're ideally going to put this in effect January 1st or first of the year, ideally. Uh, what, what would be the impact if we didn't get it done? Or what does it mean to you? terms of dollars and cents or jobs, uh, local jobs and that type of thing. Can you break it down instead of the large numbers, macro standpoint, break it down to what it means to Texas or in your area? Thank you, Rank Ranking Member Buchanan. Um, I, uh, uh, from, from, my, from our perspective, uh, uh, you know, I'll just use us on our own operation first. Uh, we are a little bit fortunate. We, we've been there for 65 plus years and uh, my dad and uncle started the operation. And uh, uh, so, you know, I think what, it, what I really want to mention is, is our younger producers, our producers that just are just getting started. Uh, uh, when I say just getting started in ag, uh, that means over the last five or 10 years. And uh, uh, we've seen prices, uh, basically we've seen price uh, farm income go down by almost 50% uh, over the past five or six years. Uh, so I think these trade agreements, uh, uh, the American farmer and rancher, uh, uh, through technology and a lot of other things, I mean, we can produce a lot of product in, in every, and so we need those markets. Um, so it, it's it's really a matter of um, we hear we hear of more bankruptcies uh, in our state. We hear of more young producers uh, saying uh, maybe it's time to quit before I file bankruptcy. And, and uh, so I, I think these trade agreements. Uh, um, Again, I mentioned, you know, Japan, China, USMCA. Okay, let me, I only got a few minutes left, so let me appreciate okay. that. I think you kind of laid it out. Ambassador, let me ask you, in terms of 
going forward, phase two or whatever you want to call it, more of a comprehensive agreement, where do you think our focus should be or what do you see as the opportunities and challenges? And I'd like to ask Mr. Goodman quickly after that so you can keep it fairly concise. Sure. Um, you know, as I had noted earlier, the agreement is not comprehensive. There are a number of exceptions um, that were not covered by the agreement, number of products. I think we have to look at ensuring that we get comprehensive coverage, both because those are a number of those products are of significant export interest to Japan, but also because trade agreements build off of one another. One becomes the precedent for the next. And U.S. agriculture exports such a wide variety of products to the world, having that many exceptions. But when you look to manufacturing autos, and as it gets much more complex and complicated, what are your thoughts on the other sectors in terms of business? Oh, I think they absolutely, um, you know, we need to approach phase two as an opportunity for a comprehensive FTA. I would say the same for product coverage in those areas um, as well. Uh, and, of course, the rules surrounding trade in goods are critically important, particularly as more of that trade involves data flows. Um, some of the things are covered in the digital aspects yeah. of that, but um, intellectual property innovation, a number of the value of U.S. products lies in also securing good um, yeah. agreement on this. Mr. Things Goodman, well. let me just move on a little bit. As a kid that grew up in Detroit, my two brothers worked in the factories and stuff, so I know that we want to have... Uh, this be more competitive, I mean, the massive trade deficits, and we've got to figure out a way to move in terms of a more comprehensive, comprehensive agreement where it's fair to everybody. What's your thoughts of some of the areas of opportunities in terms of phase two or whatever you want to call it? Well, I think the big opportunity is getting agreement with Japan to advance the rulemaking um, parts that were left behind in TPP, including ag and all the other areas that we've all uh, touched on. And, and then uh, getting better market access in Japan is important in ag. It's important in a bunch of other sectors um, uh, from uh, industrial products to um, services um, and uh, pharmaceuticals and medical devices. There are a bunch of regulatory issues there. Those are all things that are going to be uh, difficult. One other, currency. I think currency is probably going to be the single hardest issue with Japan. Uh, they will uh, resist quite forcefully, I think, the notion of of, of putting currency into the trade agreement. Uh, they did agree in TPP to a side agreement, and that's possible, but I think getting it into the agreement is going to be something Japan's going to resist. Yeah, I run out of time, but otherwise I'd give you an opportunity. But thank you and appreciate all of you being here today. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the uh, committee's uh, doing needed oversight on the uh, president's uh, trade deals. Given this administration's contempt for the Article I Congress, uh, I think that we need to take a very careful look at this, and I'm glad we're doing it today. I think we should take a fine tooth comb and go through an agreement and see if everything is as it appears. And if we find that rules were violated, or if, if I can use the term, uh, quid pro quos were involved, uh, we need to act. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, vest Congress, not the President, with the authority to regulate trade. Ultimate authority lies with the Congress. And we fail to properly vet a trade agreement. We abrogate, I believe, our own powers and further enfeeble our own branch. And that's the price of our inaction. Now, we may want to shove it off to the executive because then it's less work for us. So we become more quiet as we dig deeper into these trade deals. Congress has granted authority to the executive to negotiate agreements. We lent it. So if Congress's will is ignored in agreement, isn't worth a darn. Process matters. I'm not a process person, really. I like to get to the end result. But on every trade agreement, we must follow regular order. We cannot let this president or any president, Democrat or Republican, thumb their nose at the committee, and by extension, all of Congress. And I hope you agree with me on preserving our role. Finally, I understand that the voice of the United States Trade Representative 
rejected, rejected an honest invitation to testify today. Am I right or wrong, Mr. Chairman? I refuse. Thank you. I urge my Ways and Means uh, colleagues to join the letter I'm leading with Mr. Kildee, asking for further details on the U.S.-Japan trade agreement and the U.S.-Japan digital trade agreement. I disagree wholeheartedly with the idea that if we get one or two things that we wanted but does not affect the entire economy, that we should jump on it because a little is better than nothing. That is where we are right now, and that's where we have been minimized. We have been minimized our role. So let me ask you this question, Ms. Fetter. Having negotiated a trade agreement, you should be intimately familiar with congressional consultations and process. You've heard the chairman ask the question. Please expand on why you caution against using the Japan agreement as a model for future agreements. I'm happy to, Mr. Pascarell. Um, I think that as the Japan negotiating process showed us, agricultural trade is incredibly sensitive in a number of countries um, because of the role that agriculture plays in, economy, in those economies, the amount of employment uh, that it can in fact uh, affect in those economies and the political power of agricultural producers in those countries much as it exists in ours. And so when you look at ag trade sections of agreements, you see long tariff phase outs, you see quotas and you know vol um, volumetric ex um, limitations, you see safeguards, a number of tools to try to lessen the blow to those sectors. And the Japan agreement is no exception. And in TPP, um, frankly, it took working very closely with Congress to figure out how to manage expectations, to maximize access, and how to balance that desire to open those markets while at the same time um, you know, meeting the interests of U.S. farmers. So we lent authority to the president. You don't disagree with me and votes we've had over the past Ms. Vetter or Ms. Nasser, if you don't have time to answer the question, please get back to me. I'd appreciate that. Uh, the U.S.-Japan Free Trade Agreement includes rules of origin and origin procedures, as well as product-specific rules. Um, does Section 103A of the TPA provide the president with the authority to create rules of origin and origin procedures? And are you aware of any other instance where an administration has relied on Section 103A of TPA to create such rules? We got 15 seconds. Oh, we don't have 15 seconds. Would you get back to me with your answers on that? I would personally appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I want to conclude by saying I associate uh, myself with the words of Mr. Goodman, I think it, uh, he's, he's, been, he's reasonable in what he says, and we want trade. This is not a question of trade or no trade. I don't want to be put in that situation. I don't agree with it. Let's look at it and see what we can get. But the entire economy we're talking about, not just the Ninth District of New Jersey. Important as that is. As important as that is. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing on the U.S.-Japan trade agreements. It's difficult to follow my friend, Mr. Pasquarell, but I will try. The, this initial agreement is a great deal, and I don't think there's any disagreement on that. It's something that I believe we are all glad to see, and I'm glad we're talking about it. I also hope the administration will continue to move forward in negotiations with Japan because there is a lot more to do, and that's something else we all agree about. Now, my state benefits tremendous, tremendously under this agreement um, that we're discussing. As my colleagues have heard me say before, North Carolina produces the country's best pork barbecue. Why? Because we raise the best hogs, and the world knows it. <laughs> So North Carolina is the second largest exporter of pork. More specifically, we raise a specialty breed of pork that is the most sought after in Japan. We exported over $120 million in pork products to Japan in 2018. Under this agreement, tariffs on pork will be phased down and eliminated, 
and this opens the Jap Japan's lucrative market uh, even more uh, to my state. North Carolina also has a large and competitive poultry sector, and they too will benefit under this agreement. Japan's import tariffs on chicken products will be phased down, and their tariff on turkey will be eliminated immediately. Great news for uh, Butterball, which is in my district. Think about that at Thanksgiving. Think about me. <laughs> uh, um, and there's a lot of chatter about export of goods, but I also want to take a minute and take up talk up about American services. Japan is the fifth largest export market for the U.S. in services. In fact, we've had a trade surplus with Japan in services for the past 20 years since 1999. So we want to be sure that we're leveraging that strength because the U.S. has a strong competitive advantage with Japan in services. It's in our interest to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement that includes high standard services trade and investment rules, market access commitments. Now, Mr. Goodman, noting that you're a pragmatist, I appreciate that. I want to take a big picture view. And how would you recommend we think about U.S. export competitiveness? Because it seems to me that while manufacturing and agriculture are certainly critical, critical in North Carolina, the U.S. is a leader in many services industries, so we need to look out for those areas of the economy, too, and help support areas of future growth in services. So in terms of enhancing the U.S. economic leadership in the Asia-Pacific, can you speak um, a little bit on a comprehensive agreement touching um, pointedly on services? Thank you. Sure, happy to. Can I just first tell a personal story that my wife and I, newly married, moved to Japan and just before the, our first Thanksgiving together, and we had a hard time finding a butterball turkey in Tokyo, but we no finally, longer we finally did, <laughs> and had a very nice had a very nice Thanksgiving dinner. So, um, uh, services is critical. It's the you know largest and bigger biggest employer and grow, fastest growing employer in the United States, and. Uh, we have to be competitive, and we are competitive in services, and we have to succeed in other markets. Uh, Japan is a difficult market for services. We've had issues uh, there for many, many years. I used to be the treasury attache there. We had major financial services-related issues. Many of those still linger today. Uh, many other uh, areas of services. There's a regulatory culture there that is still um, difficult to work through. Um, and, and then, but... Japan was very supportive of us in TPP and in other forums in taking forward uh, services disciplines. So I think in principle they agree with us about the need for good regulatory environments and uh, services enhancing um, uh, rules. And so they've been actually very supportive in TPP and other forums in taking that forward. And I think we should build on that in a round two or in a, in a renewed effort in TPP. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony here today. But as good as you are, the one witness we are really hoping to hear from today is either Ambassador Lighthizer or some representative from USTR's office themselves. And the lack of that type of testimony today speaks volumes as far as the disdain that the current administration has to our role in establishing trade policy. And let's be honest today that the only reason we're sitting here discussing this de minimis, very minimal trade agreement with Japan is two main reasons. A, because the president has threatened to use very nebulous 232 national security tariffs to hit Japan's auto sector, to drive them to the table, and B, the administration wanted to bypass Congress entirely in this bilateral negotiation with Japan. And to my friends on the other side, many of whom I worked closely with the last time we got Trade Promotion Authority passed in this Congress before, this will have serious ramifications the next time we address TPA, especially Section 103A, authority. Either we're going to believe that we have a co-equal role, at least, in establishing trade policy, we might as well just submit our voting cards and go home now and just allow the executive branch to run everything. Now, I know that there was progress made in certain agriculture sectors in this agreement, and it was needed, but it wasn't complete. And as I feared leading up to the conclusion of the negotiations, in fact, materialized. Mr. Bainey, I'm glad you're here today as one of the dairy representatives we have in our country. I represent a large dairy state myself. It has been brutal to our dairy producers throughout the country in recent years. 
Now, I'm not one to say that the president's trade wars is the sole cause of the plight that our farmers and our dairy producers especially are finding themselves in today, but it's certainly piling on at exactly the wrong moment. And as I was getting a little bit of information about where negotiations were going past, I submitted a letter with Ms. Del Benny's help and Ms. Moore on this committee, along with some other members, expressing concerns of where we were going to end up with the dairy provisions. And Mr. Chairman, that letter is dated September 20th, 2019, a few weeks before the final agreement uh, was announced. I'd ask unanimous consent to have it submitted for the record. One paragraph in that letter reads, despite the President frequently asserting that his negotiations would lead to the best trade agreements for our farmers, we are now finding that this agreement would achieve inferior market access for U.S. dairy compared to competi competitors like the European Union and signatories of the, of the TPP nations on exports such as cheese, butter, skim milk powder, ice cream, condensed milk. Further, there appears to be no agreement on geographic indicators which could impact our cheese exporters due to the EU's prolific use of GIs to limit market access for U.S. dairy products around the world. And that, in fact, is what materialized in the final agreement. In fact, I've got a side-by-side -side comparison because the one ask that we made with the administration when it came to our agriculture negotiations, especially dairy, at least achieve parity with the TPP nations, with the EU, so that they're not left behind and not left in the competitive disadvantage. That is not what happened in this agreement. And I know through past history, you only get one kick at the can. Japan's not going to be interested in renegotiating any agriculture provision going forward. They just won't. And the idea that we're going to get back to some comprehensive agreement with Japan is, I think, a pipe dream. Because their response is very logical. They're going to come back and say, listen, if you want this, this parity with TPP, with EU, there's a simple solution. Get back in the tent. Rejoin TPP. And we'll give you the same access that we're giving the other countries. But don't expect us to do it outside that framework. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a comparison of TPP and EU agriculture access compared to what's contained in this agreement for the record. You got it, Chairman. So, Ms. Vetter, let me ask you, uh, as a, a seasoned negotiator in, in all of this, um, there are some WTO implications as well that we can get into. But if you could just briefly describe the importance of, at some point, the ability for us to get back into the TPP framework again and the synergies that that brings and, and how that's important for our overall strategic vision as a country. Because I still believe the President's summary, summarily rejecting TPP will go down as one of the great strategic mistakes we made as a nation in the 21st century. Well, certainly I agree with you that a TPP framework is uh, superior to a simple one-off uh, deal with Japan. Um, and when we had crafted that negotiation, we did it knowing that for U.S. agriculture in particular, Japan was a mature high-value market that would produce immediate gains for the sector. But the big investment we were making was in Southeast Asia and in the markets of Vietnam and Malaysia, where you had a growing market, a growing middle class with you know, growing incomes, where we could get our foot in the door early and then become a preferred trading partner in that same wide variety of agriculture goods throughout the region. And that, of course, um, this approach does not provide that. It's, it's simply missing. And so coming back in to do phase two, being able to do it to also have a foothold in Southeast Asia would be uh, of great interest. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd also just like to briefly mention that the SPS was left behind in this agreement. Uh, and cranberries from my home state, the biggest producing state in the nation on cranberries, was also left uh, outside this agreement. I yield back. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a dog in this fight? Uh, my farmers back home have a dog in this fight, and uh, they're anxious to see any progress on trade and. You know, uh, uh, when we talk about the consultation and the, and the Article One, Section 8 and the powers of Congress, we delegated uh, trade promotion authority to the administration. And we didn't do it to the Trump administration. We did it to the Obama administration. And many of the folks who are bemoaning today a lack of progress on trade did not vote for that trade promotion authority delegation to the Obama administration. So uh, I know that I want a comprehensive agreement. 
I know that uh, pretty much everybody in this room would prefer to see a more comprehensive agreement with Japan. Uh, I know the administration would prefer to see a more comprehensive agreement with Japan. And I listened to these experts speak, and I think I heard unan uh, unanimity that they all agree that American workers, you know, this isn't a perfect agreement, and we'd like to see it go further for autos and others. But overall, American workers will be better off with this agreement than we are without it. Uh, we can bemoan the fact that we're not in TPP. I suspect very few folks on the other side of the aisle would have voted for TPP if we had a chance to vote for it today. And so that's, that's gone, it's done, and it's over with. Uh, so we have to move on with a bilateral agreement, and that's what we're doing. And I have to take the administration at the word on a more comprehensive agreement. But I will tell you this. USMCA has been on the table for over a year. I traveled to Canada. I traveled to Mexico with a lot of folks on the other side of the aisle. And we expressed our concerns. And, and I don't think anybody can say that uh, the administration hasn't been very open with us and very active in our consultation role. And they continue to work on it today. And that agreement has been approved by Canada and Mexico for six months. And it's been sitting, gathering dust uh, uh, with the, on the speaker's side waiting for a vote. We have the votes. <laughs> if you pull it up for a vote, it'll pass. And I promise you <laughs> that we can bemoan the, progress on, uh, the lack of progress on trade, but I promise you those ministers in Japan chuckled a little bit when they recognize that we can't even get USMCA across the line. Why is that? You know, everybody agrees. I, I have asked every Democrat witness that has been in front of us, every Republican witness, everyone agrees American workers will be better off under USMCA than they are without it. I have asked what Mexico gave up, and we can have, you know, border adjustment, uh, 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 sanitation rules, uh, uh, I can, uh, uh, rules of origin, uh, hourly wages, labor rules, environment. We have this laundry list of things that Mexico and, uh, and Canada gave up, and we gave up. I can't find anybody who can name anything we gave up. It's going to be better for American workers. And yet it's sitting there gathering dust. Why? I don't know. I mean, if it's better for American workers and the other parties have agreed to it, why would we hold it up? I suspect it's for political purposes. I suspect that we are sacrificing, we are holding hostage American workers for the sake of the next election. And I think that is horrific for our economy. Trade, you know, we've gone through tax reform, we've gone through regulatory reform, we're trying to make the country competitive. Trade is the next big thing. And for us to hold this up and to sacrifice American workers for political purposes just is a great example of how broken how broken this system is, and a great example of why 435 people can't negotiate a trade agreement. We have, to, we have to delegate authority to the administration. We can retain the right to approve or disapprove. We can argue over, you know, the commas and the colons on whether or not we delegated this much authority or we did not. But as Mr. Boehning said, we needed a win. We need a win. If, we, if we're serious about trade, if we really want to make this country competitive in trade, if we're serious about lifting up American workers, we have to show the world that we, as a legislative body, are not paralyzed by politics, by who's going to win the next election. And we've got to show that we are serious leaders and that we're going to put our constituents first. And the first thing we need to do is stop arguing about whether we've delegated this authority or whether we've been consulted enough on this agreement this small agreement to move ag forward. And we need to pass UMC, USMCA, and we need, to, we need to do it six months ago. Stop the politics. Let's put the American workers first. I yield back. I will, I will just say, as uh, somebody who's been involved with some of these uh, discussions, there's been a lot of hard work to make the agreement better, which I think will be revealed uh, as we're able to have the fruition of this. We've made clear for months things at least the majority of this committee was concerned with in terms of environment, pharmaceuticals, enforcement, which has been sorely lacking. Um, uh, and I think you, will, you may not agree, but I think it'll be clear that there was work done to make 
it compatible with what the majority of the committee, and I think the majority of Americans, expect from a trade agreement. I don't want to get into too much of a debate here. I want to turn instead uh, to Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Let me just, Chairman. Before I go forward, in order to balance out uh, the uh, equity in terms of the dais, uh, we will turn uh, after Mr. Davis, uh, we will turn to Mr. Kildee, and then we will alternate back and forth to end up uh, even at the end. And then we will turn to some guests that we have who are so interested in this subject that they pride themselves away from other important congressional business to sit and join us, and we welcome you. You're not on the Intel Committee, are you? <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell us. <laughs> Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this oversight hearing. I also want to thank all of the expert witnesses for coming and sharing with us this morning. And I'm pleased that the farmers in Illinois, Texas, and perhaps in other places throughout the country are going to experience some relief as a result. Of course, like all others who've expressed it, I would like to have seen a more comprehensive agreement coming from a state with a strong agricultural base, as well as a strong manufacturing base. We're always concerned about deficits. And I note that the automobile exports from Japan account for much of the deficit that we have with that country. Um, Mr. Nass, I wanted to ask you, did you see anything in the agreement or did you note any trend during negotiations that might lead in the direction of reducing the deficit that we are experiencing with Japan in relationship to automobile imports and exports? Uh, the, the answer to that question is no, and thank you for the question. Uh, right now, the ratio is 89 to 1. 89 Japanese cars are shipped here for every one car we sell over there. And this, um, this agreement um, trades away some industrial goods, so it could lead to the opposite, actually. Let me ask you, I understand that the Labor Advisory Committee prepared a full report on the proposed deal, which was shared with the committee for weeks after its submission. Could you share some of what that report suggested? Um, I, I'm not sure if that, if I'm able to, from you know a confidentiality standpoint. All right, then we'll. I'd love to. I'd love to, <laughs> but I, I don't think I can. <laughs> I'll, I'll buy that. Especially given the... Uh, I really, really want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me ask. Mr. Goodman, in terms of technology and, and digital advancement, how do we stack up with Japan in, in, in terms of import-export relationships, access... I, off the top of my head, I don't have the trade um, numbers, but I would say we're both very competitive in high value a added um, technology products and services. Uh, Japan makes uh, a high percentage of your iPhone, uh, the really sophisticated parts. Uh, we make uh, very sophisticated technology in a range of areas um, from healthcare to, uh, to chips. Uh, and so it's a, it's a uh, I, again, I don't know the trade numbers, but I'd say it's a, it's a robust and uh, mutually beneficial exchange in that sector. Well, let me thank you very much, and let me just add, I do believe that it is necessary that the administration take another look at its relationship with Congress in terms of transparency, in terms of engagement, and involvement in the negotiation process. 
because without it, then of course our constituents really want to know what our role is and what it becomes. So Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this oversight hearing. And again, I thank the witnesses for sharing with us. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Kildee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Chairman Blunar, for, for holding this hearing. I think this is an important role for the subcommittee. And I look forward to more of these discussions. Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, you've all added, um, each of you, uh, a, a great deal to this conversation. And as my colleagues, some have noted anyway, it is unfortunate that um, there is no one from USTR to address this hearing. It's one thing not to be consulted in the first place. It's something else to hold a hearing on the specific subject and not have any representation whatsoever. Um, I mean, if the idea is that they're so busy working on USMCA that they didn't really have time to consult with us on the agreement, that's a little hard to believe when they actually had time to actually negotiate the agreement. I mean, part of the negotiating the agreement is consulting with us. Uh, and also, before I ask my question, I just want to comment. I think Mr. Rice and I probably do share some views on USMCA. It's a better agreement. I don't think there's any way to doubt that it's a better agreement, but it is not my view that a not so good agreement that you can't enforce the original NAFTA agreement being replaced with a better agreement that you can't enforce isn't going to do a whole lot of good for the people that I represent. So there are some elements that still need to be completed. And I will say, as, as one who's been uh, involved in this, there's a lot of work going into trying to get that right. And so uh, it's better to get it right and take a couple of extra months than to get it wrong and deal with what we've dealt with in the last 25 years, at least where I come from. So if I could comment or ask um, specifically Mr. Nasser a question. Uh, you know, I'm from Flint, as we all know. Um, uh, yeah, no kidding. Uh, yes, please do. Make note. Make note. Um, you know, it's an auto community. It's the place where GM was, was founded. Um, we make great vehicles. But... Ford, for example, doesn't sell any cars in Japan. In 2018, GM sold 700 cars there. This is a nation, Japan, with 126 million people, 68,900,000 vehicles. Last year, there were over 4 million, I mean, sorry, this year, just in the first nine months, over 4 million new registrations of vehicles in Japan. They don't tariff our vehicles. Is it they just don't like American cars? Why can't we have better access to that market? Because the country has deter been determined to keep a closed market for a long time, and they continue to do so. Um, I want to just, uh, you know, point out that uh, this is, as I said, this is not a new problem. I mean, I I'm reading here, you know, the various agreements that uh, President Reagan, uh, Bush, uh, President Clinton had, and... Uh, Here's just one quick quote. It says uh, from, from Carl Levin and, and Arlen Specter, it is unacceptable the current Japanese auto and auto parts barriers continue to remain in place. That was said in 2000. That remains true today. It's, it, auto companies from around the world have trouble going into Japan because they have a, a tons of policies that maintain the closed market. The currency manipulation is a very, very critical one because that gives us a clear price advantage. And they have overcapacity. They make a lot more cars than can be sold than Japan can handle. So they really need export markets. That's a major motivator for why they want to trade with us in the first place. It's a big prize. So um, that's why it is that way. I wonder, you know, and, and the the issue of currency is obviously a big one. It's not addressed. Many of us have long felt, uh, even in the conversation around TPA, that because currency is such a foundational element of trade that it ought to be addressed in an agreement that addresses trade. But I wonder if you might just briefly, because we only have about 45 seconds, comment or give an example of one of these other non-tariff uh, barriers that we face in the auto sector. 
Sure. Uh, well, there's there's discriminatory taxes, first of all, that happen on Im- that are different from imports uh, to cars built there. There's a whole dealership network where actually to establish a dealership is extremely difficult for a company that's based out of Japan within Japan. Thank you. I, I appreciate the, the, the testimony of the panel. This is an important conversation. Mr. Chairman, I really do look forward to many more of these discussions. We have a lot to get to, and, uh, and I appreciate all your participation. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, It's a great opportunity for us to highlight um, another win that President Trump has done for the American farmer. I would would like to enter into a record, a letter that was sent to all the members of the Ways and Means Committee today from over 30 different agriculture organizations. Um, And from their letter, it says they write this letter Um, to express our strong support for the U.S.-Japan trade agreement phase one, so which is what we're discussing today. And I do want to highlight some of the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in this letter, I do want to point out some of the the organizations that's in it, since dairy has came up. Um, The U.S. Dairy Export Council is signed onto this letter. The National Milk Producers Federation is signed onto this letter. The National Dairy Foods Association is signed on to this letter along with the American Soybean Association, American Farm Bureau, over 30 different ag organizations in strong support of this letter. I'm frankly surprised by the the negative tone that we've heard from uh, my uh, Democrat colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I don't know if it's because they've been too focused on impeachment to really understand what was in this agreement but there's a lot of very, very good stuff for the American farmer. Thanks to the efforts of President Trump, the U.S. will soon have substantial market access to Japan with the overwhelming majority of tariff barriers lifted for U.S. agriculture products. This is great news for Missouri farmers and a critical down payment towards a larger agreement. Thanks to the administration's aggressive two-step approach, Missouri farmers will no longer be at a disadvantage competing with other countries. And while this is a great win, there is still more work to be done, in my opinion, both for agriculture and other sectors as well. For instance, I'm hopeful that the administration will continue to work with Japan towards opening our market in regards to rice. Ms. Vetter, rice is an important commodity in Southern Missouri. Whether it's growers, truck drivers, processors or shippers, anytime rice is being shipped, communities benefit in Southeast Missouri. Japan too depends on rice, understanding that this agreement is meant to be a first step. It is important that rice does not lose ground in this agreement with Japan. Ms. Vetter, what is your opinion on the likelihood of U.S. rice access in the comprehensive agreement? Well, as I'm sure you are aware, Um, The TPP negotiation, which became the template for this current uh, U.S.-Japan deal and, of course, the CPTPP and European agreements as well, had Japan put for the first time on the table its six sacred products, um, beef, pork, dairy, wheat, rice, and sugar, um, pretty much emblazoned in my brain after uh, that that TPP process. And the reason they did so was the opportunity to gain access to 11 other markets at the same time. And so the political leverage of a multilateral negotiation or a regional negotiation allowed them to make that trade. Um, But as I'm sure you know, of the six, rice was absolutely the most difficult. And the concessions that they gave in rice were really only to two of those TPP partners, to the United States and to Australia. And the level of access that Japan was able to achieve in industrial goods and autos was very much related to their generosity and how much they were willing to give on rice. And so I have not been uh, part of this negotiating process. I have not been consulted by this administration, so I do not know. Um, what is the basis or the background that has been laid for a phase two, and whether there is an understanding that all U.S. products would also be on the table 
uh, in addition to all of those okay. from Japan. But I think those would be necessary conditions to seeing further uh, concessions from our Japanese partners. I just want to make it clear that um, rice needs to be part of the conversation. I know the administration has uh, delivered real progress for rice farmers in both the early China agreement and South Korea just recently. There's no reason rice can't be part of this agreement. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the rest of my time. And Mr. Rice associates himself with his remarks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Panetta. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and thank you for having this um, long needed uh, hearing on this important issue. Uh, and thanks to all the witnesses uh, who are here as well. Thank you for your service and thank you for your preparation uh, to be here as well as you being here. Um, I think we all know that following uh, the withdrawal from the TPP, negotiating a uh, trade deal with Japan has been a priority, uh, especially for the agriculture producers in my district. As many of you know, as many of on this dais know, I come from the salad bowl of the world on the central coast of California, uh, as I'm fond of saying. And Japan is my district's fourth largest agricultural export market. So it is important I believe that uh, why this administration should continue to consult with Congress, in particular this committee, when it comes to negotiating with tra important trade partners, especially like Japan. But as we know and as we're hearing, that just unfortunately didn't happen. And yes, I am thankful for some of the tariff reductions and the elimination for some of the California products, like it's wine, it's beef, uh, it's cut flowers and some other produce. But I do believe that the lack of consultation uh, led to some real missed opportunities, as well as some oversights, unfortunately, including potential gains in market access for strawberries, lettuce, rice, as we heard, and also the reduction of technical barriers to trade. Now, I know that we will continue to try to gain market access for these select products, uh, but unfortunately it was prioritized, it, it, those were prioritized over tackle, tackling more difficult issues, which I believe were put off for later, although we really don't know when that later is. So as this administration continues to work on phase two of this agreement, I hope that we can improve market access more equitably and address these technical bar barriers to trade beyond just tariffs. I expect that the negotiators will keep members of this committee apprised of developments and hopefully seek our counsel. And I do hope that this, this administration will accept the next invitation to appear before this committee. This committee, especially uh, this, tr this subcommittee and my colleagues up here, should hear directly from our negotiators on agreements such as this one, which really are critical to our economy. Now, because in my district we have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, dealing with Japan has led to uh, a number of issues, mainly when it comes to sanitary, phytosanitary issues. Lettuce, uh, and it's basically uh, caused a lot of producers to just stop trading unfortunately, with Japan. Lettuce, for example, has almost abandoned the market. Now, obviously, uh, Ambassador Vetter, you know that in the multilateral TP, T, TPP, the SPS provisions were positive improvements. Can you just comment uh, briefly as to whether or not you would agree with the assessment made by this administration that stronger trade terms can be negotiated in a bilateral agreement as opposed to a multilateral agreement? Thank you. As I had commented to the last question by Congressman from Missouri, um, I think in the case of Japan and discussing its agricultural market, it was actually helpful to be able to have those negotiations where the trade-off for opening its agricultural market provided it access to multiple other markets for other sectors. Um, but in the case of, of rules, I think it was also quite helpful to have the dynamic among the TPP countries where you had strong priorities around creating a different uh, culture for doing business in the region and where they would see the benefits of those rules uh, fully. 
Um, I do agree with you that SPS uh, barriers can, in many cases, be more difficult to overcome than tariffs, um, that they do need to remain uh, a priority uh, and would certainly encourage uh, that the relationship among U.S. and Japanese regulators continue to be fostered outside of direct uh, negotiations uh, of a trade agreement, which I think they can do and that our um, our great professionals in FDA and USDA uh, try to work out those issues uh, with their with their counterparts. But um, you know that in any second phase of negotiations, I think it's difficult to say that there is a complete ag package if you don't look at the tariffs and the rules, particularly SPS rules uh, that would accompany them. Point well taken. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Mr. Benny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for holding this hearing, and thanks to all our witnesses for being here. Um, I share the concern with many of my colleagues that um, no one from the, the Trade Representative's office was able to join us today. Um, consulting with Congress is a critical part of the trade process, and I think we end up with better agreements as a result. Um, one part of this agreement obviously has been on um, on the digital side, the digital agreement. Um, Mr. Goodman, I wanted to ask you, um, do you think we need to build on the digital agreement with Japan, use it to bring other like-minded countries in the region um, to tables such as Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand? Yes, with three underlines under it. Um, <laughs> th this is the, I'd say, the big challenge uh, in trade, period. Going forward, we have to we have to get the kinds of rules that were in this deal and originally in TPP extended and improved in USMCA. We have to get those pushed out to those partners, Singapore, Australia, others, and beyond, because uh, because we all know uh, that that there is that the data in particular is everywhere and every in, involved in everything, and there are not rules. Uh, there there are rules about you know, there was a, there's a WTO for trade, there's an IMF for monetary issues, there's a World Bank to get development sort of standards pushed out. There's no sort of digital data institutions, no building in Geneva, there's no, there's no uh, governance structure for this. And I think that's the big challenge really going forward. And there's a big competition underway because you've got the U.S. who's still trying to get our own sort of act together and figuring out what we want in terms of the balance between privacy and data flows and other aspects of this question. Uh, you've got Europe that's made a decision on privacy, and we're all having to now live with that. Uh, I think it isn't entirely comfortable for a lot of us. Uh, and then China's got you know a completely different approach, and they're pushing that out through various means. So I think this is there's this is no issue that there is higher stakes in. And we should be working at every forum, the APEC uh, forum in Asia with those partners, G20. Uh, both those partners are in practice in in that group. Every other forum we can find, WTO, e-commerce agreement, to push out our preferred approach. It's critical. And we need to have a high standards agreement. Um, I mean, in your opinion, how important is it that we work to have a multilateral digital agreement? And as you said, it's across all sectors because digital impacts every segment of our economy. Um, but how important is it to have a multilateral digital agreement in, Asia, in the Asia-Pacific um, because we need a high standard alternative to the regional comprehensive economic partnership. Last part of your question doesn't worry me. I don't think the regional comprehensive economic partnership, it's symbolically important, but in practice, it's not going to advance those rules very far. But it's a symbol of our absence, and so it's important to show, it, it highlights why we need to be back in this game. Um, I, I think that um, we... I think plurilateral is the way to think about this, meaning a few countries or subsets of the of the world uh, and in, of that region that are probably more likely to agree on a sort of common set of high standards. Um, and so I think various means trilaterally with the EU, uh, through APEC, uh, through uh, coalitions of countries that are willing to, uh, to move forward on those issues is probably the more promising route than trying to get some comprehensive multilateral approach. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Vetter, um, obviously, is the lead negotiator um, on the on TPP on agriculture. Um, you're able to secure TPP-wide uh, tariff rate quotas for butter, for skim milk powder, evaporated milk, and condensed milk. Um, 
I have a big dairy district, and these were key exports for many of the dairy farmers that I represent. Um, so I'm disappointed that USTR was not able to secure those commitments um, from Japan in this deal. Uh, if the administration ever gets to negotiating a phase two, um, what concessions do you think that the United States would have to give to get Japan to give us the TPP trade rate quotas in these areas? Um, thank you for that, that question. Obviously, um, the dairy category was one of those sacred product categories, and uh, butter and powder specifically were two of the most sacred products within that category. Um, and of course, um, the tariff rate quotas that were secured through TPP were available to TPP countries as a whole. Um, the United States felt that having a larger TPP-wide quota would uh, actually allow us to compete for more or to secure more volume, thinking about where we would fall relative to the other countries with market share. Um, but in order to provide then access under a U.S.-Japan bilateral agreement, that would have required Japan to let in more volume overall of that product. And that's a politically sensitive uh, proposition for them. Um, so just bearing that in mind, again, the comprehensiveness and how attractive the overall package would be in a phase two for Japan, um, I would think based on the previous dynamics of our negotiation, uh, would be what Japan would consider uh, as to whether they could further uh, examine those politically sensitive products. But again, not having been part of the uh, the modalities or the, the terms of the negotiation um, for this set of talks for the agreement, um, nor having knowledge on the basis that uh, U.S. and Japan laid out for a phase two, uh, it's difficult to say how the negotiations have been structured to drive or, or not drive toward the, that result. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, just quick, Ms. Delbeni, you actually took one of my questions. Um, I would love to have a side conversation with you about everything from internet privacy standards to um, some protocols. It's something we've been fixated in our office on for a couple of years now. Um, Madam Ambassador, can I actually sort of take us a slightly different, because the hazard of being at this end of the table is everyone's sort of asked your questions. What does the future look like? Um, we have some articles on talking about, and th these are a little tough because some, you know, you're, you're trying to make assumptions you know, thousands of miles away. We see stories that much of um, what's happening with Japan's um, demographics, um, rural depopulation in their agricultural communities. Is there a way or is it something you've been involved in when you're involved in those negotiations and discussions saying, what does the future of our economies look like? How do we build the synergy? What's happening to us all demographically? And so it's everything from how does our agricultural prowess backfill Japan's demographic needs, their prowess on solid state batteries, and their technology advances that, if they're successful, help the entire world. Do you try to future proof part of the discussion of what the windows look like? not right now, not the satiation of our today's politics, but over the next couple decades? Well, Congressman, I think that's the point of doing a comprehensive trade agreement and trying to open on as many categories of products as possible simultaneously. Not that you are keeping score about val value on one side or the other at a particular point in time, but that you are trying to anticipate and provide an opportunity for U.S. producers um, to be able to fill needs as they arise and as our economies evolve. So, so within that, um, uh, Japan has been very um, scientific, very progressive in their understanding of um, genetically modified crops and their efficacies on when designed properly are actually really good for the environment because they have much less pesticide load or water load or those things. Do you see some of those types of discussions of, hey, th these are some of the things we're really good at, here's some of the things they're very good at on the technology, and, and being able to take the um, benefits from each society's expertises. 
And, and do you see that future-proofing, um, let's call it a phase two, or just, as you would use the term, more comprehensive? I think that we, we certainly had discussions about demographic trends, um, the structure of Japan's agricultural market, where they might have particular advantages or disadvantages, and how to, to draft agreement accordingly. Um, at the same time, we were negotiating. Their whole cooperative system was undergoing a reform, uh, trying to look at the fact that they face some of the same challenges we do, aging farmers, um, no succession plans, uh, things like that. So, yes, I mean, I think much of that is structured into the current agreement. We, we should probably do a quick explanation because uh, we're way out on a rabbit hole. For, sure. Um, there's some data out there that much of rural Japan's age, um, their younger populations over the last three decades have abandoned those areas, and they're actually hitting a pretty brutal age cliff. Um, so the adoption of technology in those areas, but then does our prowess and our cost efficiencies backfill that? Is that a fair way to describe it? I, I think that's right. And I think if you look at those areas in agriculture where Japan really wanted an opportunity to export to us, it was in specialty products like Wagyu beef, where we've provided mm -hmm. some opening. It was in very high quality and uh, produce, melons, um, things where they see themselves perhaps as smaller volume, but higher value producers and trying to develop and export, um, export opportunities for those producers. Um, but I would also say that if you look at those demographic trends in Japan, where they are a high-value market, they do have a decreasing population and it a is. demographic where volume-wise, volume they may purchase less. And that's why we should think of, I think, this agreement as an important opportunity to keep shipping those products, but it is not an answer to... Uh, you know, really being able to make inroads into growing populations it, and increasing. In value. our last couple seconds, it's also one of the concerns I constantly have, particularly on our reliance of agriculture, is there's technologies coming that may dramatically change efficiency of growth. Yes. And as those technologies change, um, it, it's it, it, we're not the only country that's going to own um, that synthetic biology that makes plants grow dramatically faster. So in the smaller plots of land, you can grow much more product. What happens if, if you've relied heavily on agriculture? So we, we, it, it's, it's hard, but we have to deal with the reality of the science is coming. And how do we future-proof these agreements? So with that, I I'm, thank you for your tolerance, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this trade subcommittee hearings. Very helpful. And thank you all for being here, although I, I share my colleague's disappointment that USTR chose not to answer our invitation. You'd think if you were proud of what you were done, you'd be willing to come and talk to us about it. And one of the most troublesome and disappointing aspects is that USTR agreed to text with the Japanese prior to showing it to Congress or any of the cleared advisors. I certainly hope that that won't be the process in phase two, if there is a phase two. But Ambassador Vetter, when you were negotiating TPP, did you ever agree to outcomes with your counterparties from other countries before briefing cleared advisors or members of Congress? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Uh, we certainly briefed Congress any time there was a new major proposal. Um, and as uh, those results were developing, uh, provided briefings to um, discuss how uh, the structure of agreements on particular products may come together to get uh, advice and, and create awareness. Great, thanks. Mr. Nasser, you, you, you talked about the absence of labor and environmental provisions. They, they, Japan joined CPTPP that has labor and environmental provisions. Um, we are, we're near, on the five-year line allegedly with USMCA, which has the May 10th labor and environmental provisions in it. Why not? The labor chapters thus far in our FTAs have been completely toothless. They have had zero positive impact for workers. They have been failures. So, I mean, you know, the reality is, is that with USMCA, which has been talked about a lot today, um, no one hates the current NAFTA more than auto workers. You can trust me on that. Um, I can't even list all the parts manufacturers and, and, um, OEMs that have left to go to Mexico and then sell those cars back here. That's not going to change unless we have enforceable labor standards that, that actually change companies' behavior 
it actually leads to them treating workers better. So, um, you know, that, I think those elements are critical in any trade agreement. Thank you. Mr. Goodman, you expressed skepticism that either side would be willing to make the stage two negotiations a priority, at least in 2020, given that Japan seems to have gotten pretty much everything that it wanted in it, and we still have a lot that we would like from dairy to rice to um, labor and environmental provisions. Is there any credible reason to think that stage two is going to happen? As I say, I, uh, Congressman, I, I think it's going to be very unlikely that we're going to get into um, a, a serious um, round two negotiation. I think there will be some conversations, but I don't think we're going to have serious negotiations at a high level and certainly not reach an agreement next year. Um, I mean, I think Japan does have offensive interests in, in this still. Uh, they didn't get um, anything on the auto side. Uh, they didn't get uh, uh, the, the, the phase out of the 2.5 tariff on autos that they had gotten under TPP. Um, and so they've still got interests on their side. So I think there is sort of, in principle, there's a deal to be had. I mean, there's, there's a conversation to be had about those trade-offs, but I just think it's not going to happen in practice. There are other priorities. And Mr. Goodman, I think this question is for you, but, you know, the people have raised the concern that this narrow, incomplete phase one U.S.-Japan free trade agreement could violate section 14 of uh, the WTO articles. How concerned do we have to be about that? Again, I'm not a lawyer, um, so a lawyer um, flagged that for me as an issue that, that we have to be concerned about. It's Article 24, I believe, 24, of, the, okay. of the WTO yeah. um, that requires the substantially all the trade between the partners to be agreed. There is a, a sort of not a quite an exception, but there's a provision for uh, notifying an interim agreement as long as there's kind of a schedule for when you're going to get to the comprehensive, which I don't believe we have done, at least not yet. So yeah, there are, there are concerns, and it, it's not only concerns about whether we've violated WTO or not ourselves, but whether we're setting an example for others if they go down this road and create favor, uh, preferential deals that exclude us. So I think there's a reason for concern. Mr. Nash, as you probably know, my family business sells Mazdas and Subarus, um, and we love selling them. But I am really concerned as a former automobile dealer by all the restrictions in Japan. You know, the, the dealer network, the government subsidies, the, you know, basically unrealistic um, standards on safety and, and other things. How do we overcome that without starting another tariff war? I, I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but I, you know, at a certain point, you got to call like you see it. And, you know, it's whack-a-mole. And administration after administration has tried. So I think any opening of U.S. access in exchange for a promise that Japan's going to change their ways is a bad deal for U.S. auto workers. So I think it's really a tough thing to do. All right, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, I also really appreciate uh, having this hearing to discuss um, an important issue and basically exercise a key function of Congress, which is, and especially for this subcommittee, which is providing oversight of the executive branch's trade policies and, and trade negotiations. You know, today we're, we're looking at the recently signed U.S.-Japan trade agreement, um, otherwise known as a mini trade deal or a phase one deal. And um, disappointingly, USTR declined our invitation to be here today to provide their testimony and explain their decision-making process. And while I mean no disrespect to our incredibly impressive and capable witnesses, I can imagine that you too are only guessing at what USTR was thinking in negotiating these, uh, this mini deal. And I'll also admit that I'm deeply suspicious that these phases are merely an attempt to avoid congressional oversight, much like not showing up today. Um, but let me just see, based on the testimonies today, let me see if we can, uh, I can summarize how we find ourselves here today with a mini deal with Japan, one of our largest trading partners, an ally, somebody uh, with whom there should be a more comprehensive deal. So first, the administration puts U.S. ag at a disadvantage to other countries by withdrawing from a comprehensive trade deal, also known as TPP. And then farmers are feeling a lot of pain. As Mr. Benning said, we needed a win. Um, no doubt some of that desperation tinging your voice results from the crushing impact of other uh, trade policies uh, taken by this administration. And so in order to address that pain for the farmers, 
The administration then negotiated a suboptimal, using Mr. Goodman's word, a suboptimal mini deal um, that Mr. Nassar says sets a dangerous precedent of trading industrial goods for ag. And now the administration is taking a victory lap on having completed a mini deal. So in sum, a comprehensive deal is better than a mini deal, but a mini deal is better than nothing. That seems to me to be a pretty low bar for U.S. trade policy. Mr. Goodman, um, you know, there seems to be some hesitancy um, to criticize this particular deal. There, uh, I hear industry holding out hope for phase two, but you've said um, that you didn't think that phase two would be coming. Um, you also said yesterday in a briefing that you didn't think China phase two was likely either. Um, is there a negative economic co uh, cost to the U.S., um, to U.S. companies, to U.S. consumers from negotiating this way? Um, yes, I believe that uh, this is, as I mentioned, suboptimal or second best, um, and I think will have implications, including for the sectors um, that have not benefited from uh, from uh, opening of, of trade. Um, and I, I think that if we're not pushing, as I mentioned, the rules in digital or other areas uh, that were incorporated in TPP and have been, I think, in some cases improved upon in what, as I understand, the, the USMCA um, content. Uh, if, if we're not pushing those things out, then there's a real risk that the, the economic playing field that we're going to be operating on, our businesses, our farmers and ranchers and others are going to be operating, service providers, is going to be tilted against us, and we're going to find it much harder to sell and, um, to, uh, and even to buy on competitive terms. So I think, uh, I think this is, has economic impact. Great, thank you. Mr. Benning, you told um, uh, some heart-wrenching um, uh, uh, stories about bankruptcies increasing, um, that some farmers are thinking about selling before they have to face bankruptcy. Um, it, it can't just be the absence to date of um, that US-Japan uh, mini deal that would have created this troubling pattern. Can you? Um, provide a little context on what other pressures are causing these types of hardships with farmers? <clears throat> yes, I mean, I can, I can attempt to, Congressman Murphy. Um, you know, as some of it, I guess, uh, uh, just comes down to supply and demand to a certain extent. I mean, we, we, you know, uh, we, we, uh, production is up uh, over the past several years. Uh, uh, so I, I think... I think the trade issue is is a is definitely a major factor uh, when we look at trade as a whole. Uh, we haven't talked about China a whole lot uh, today. We've talked more about uh, Japan and and uh, and uh, USMCA, uh, but uh, it's it's kind of it, it kind of a snowball effect. Let me, let me just see if I can summarize this, is that farmers' productivity is up, but U.S. Um, administration's trade policy is suppressing demand. Thank you, and I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to change the tone just a little bit and say that I'm deeply appreciative of the uh, Ambassador Lighthizer's job that he did on the Japanese uh, trade agreement. I was in Japan in last February, and uh, they talked about almost nothing else but their desire to get a trade deal with the United States. Uh, we were at the same time dealing with France and an internet tax on uh, internet providers, China and the tariffs, Brexit, uh, the USMCA, and North Korea, all of those things are going on at the same time, yet uh, this administration made it a priority to try to get a trade deal with Japan. And I think uh, both Japan and the United States should be commended for being able to sit down and at least get to a phase one agreement. And a phase one agreement that obviously not everyone's happy with, but when we look back on this last year, I think that it is a, an accomplishment to get some kind of a trade deal done. Um, I, think, I, I think that it is a more important thing for the U.S. Uh, trade ambassador to, today to be working on 
in trying to work out those details that, um, that I truly believe the Democrats had been working on the last two or three months, the, the details uh, that they feel like they need in the USMCA, and truly hope that that is where the, the effort is going right now so that we can get a deal here before the end, end of the year on that. Um, Mr. Bainey, I read, was glad to see your recent op-ed in the uh, Houston newspaper. Uh, I don't always read the Houston newspaper since I'm a Dallasite, but it was a good article, and uh, I appreciate you emphasizing the, the benefits that the USMCA will have uh, for American farmers and ranchers. I share your enthusiasm for that support. What impact would passing the USMCA, what immediate impact would it have on Texas farmers, first of all, and then farmers in general? <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman Martin. Um, you know, it's been pointed out in, in, in more than one place is, is ag doesn't get a, a super boost or from, from, uh, from USMCA over NAFTA because we felt like NAFTA has been good for ag. But uh, at, some, at some discussion earlier today, it's, some of it is psychological. Just having a good deal, which USMCA, having a deal done, uh, there's, you know, we've, we've talked about it in our ag circles. Uh, other potential trading partners across the world, I think they definitely look at USMCA as a, as, you, you guys can't get this done. I mean, th this is three, three neighbors uh, that have worked on a deal for a couple of years now. Uh, so I think it's psychological to a certain extent. I, I, and I think it's, and some of it is psychological, you, you know, to, to keep doing what you're doing every day. Uh, so with that being said, uh, uh, and there are, some, there are some quantitative improvements too, uh, to dairy uh, with Canada and to wheat with Canada. Uh, so uh, I, I think it would be uh, uh, just a win uh, uh, and uh, something that, that, that we feel like, uh, we, we, from, from what I hear from, from industry-wide, it's, it's, it's been good. And from what I do hear, the uh, trade advisory uh, folks have visited with uh, folks from both sides of the aisle uh, to address some of their concerns. So uh, we're looking forward to that one happening, hopefully by the end of the year. Thank, thanks to the whole panel for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. And to our panelists, we thank you for taking time to uh, come and share your expertise with us. Um, I want to start by saying that, you know, when, when I look at uh, the, the U.S. trade, rela uh, U.S.-Japan relationship, it is, it is very deep. It's very important um, across a lot of fronts. And being able to maintain that relationship going forward and actually to strengthen that relationship is vitally important. And of course, trade will be a key component of that. I look at what happens in my state of Georgia. Uh, the relationship between Japan and the state of Georgia is very strong. The number of manufacturers that are there, just to give you an example of one manufacturer in my district, um, Yamaha is based in my district. Um, so all of the golf carts and um, four-wheelers and that kind of thing are built, uh, built in my district. We understand how important trade is, and we won't comprehensive trade agreements to be in place. But while we work towards that, we also have to recognize that there are rural parts of our, of, our dis, of, of our districts, of our states, of our counties that are really hurting right now. And so when I look at this, this first phase one, I look, at, I look at the impact that it could have in rural Georgia and rural America, I think it's pretty positive. And so while we flounder around talking about how do we, how do we eat this whole elephant with this trade agreement, I suggest I kind of like the idea of we eat it one bite at a time. And I like the fact that we're getting something done that will have a positive impact in my district. Um, is there any perfect process in this? No. But I will tell you what, while you scream and holler for a perfect process and all of the, the things that we're talking about, you have folks that are in rural America that are dying on the vine. And providing them a lifeline is vitally important. We have cattle that are produced in all 159 counties in the state of Georgia. And I think, I think it, is, it, it, is, it is a very important part of our local economies, whether it's the Angus industry, Charlay, 
Simital, it do, they, these are all vitally important. Mr. Bainan, can you talk about what that would mean to cattle producers in, in a district like mine? Congressman, you, you're referring uh, specifically to the Japan agree agreement? Yes, correct. Well, there, there's, I mentioned earlier in my testimony, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the folks in, in uh, Japan, the, the population in Japan uh, being a high income uh, population and the beef that's raised in this country, in your state and the rest of the, uh, is, is a high value product and it is a quality product. Uh, I mentioned earlier that on a trip several years ago, uh, when, when we had a, I can, I do not speak any Japanese, but, uh, even visiting the, uh, uh, the Costco's, the, the, uh, the higher end supermarkets, Japanese consumers want our beef and, uh, um, Already, uh, beef is is exported around the, around the world. Uh, I think there's no doubt that it will it will benefit our beef producers to a much greater degree than it will benefit any other beef producers in this country in the world. Thank you for that. Um, going back to uh, some comments that are made on the on the um, USMCA, um, you know. I, I find it pretty remarkable as, as I've had the opportunity to, to speak with colleagues on, on both sides of the aisle, had the opportunity to travel to Canada with the chairman of the committee and, and other colleagues, um, meeting with the um, uh, trade representatives from, from our friends to the south in Mexico. We keep talking about the enforcement piece of this. And what I find remarkable is we're all saying the same thing. We all want strong enforcement of these trade deals. It does us no good to have a trade deal that we can't enforce. And so I'm very hopeful that as we go through this process and we're all pushing towards the same common goal of making sure that our economies are strong, that, that our workers have great opportunities, that we see really remarkable opportunities for American families, and we recognize that enforcement of these provisions is vitally important, I hope that we can all very quickly get on the same page and get this deal done. Again, it's important for the for the country, but when I look at uh, when I look when I look at what the USMCA and and this agreement with Japan could mean to rural America, it is incredible and it's important. If we don't address this and we don't get a focus on rural America, we're going to wind up taking the prosperity that we ha that, that we have gained in this country, and we're going to use it to fight poverty in rural America. We can avoid that expense. This country has done an amazing job of turning rural America into the next inner city, and it's a shame. And I think that we can fight back against that. I think that we can rebalance this. And I think that American workers that are in the rural parts of, of our economy are just as important of those in the suburban and, ur and urban areas as well. I can tell you, whether you're building cars, whether you're farming, does not matter. It is vitally important that we do this. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I thank you for allowing me to be a guest here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our panel. Uh, certainly, uh, thank you to Ambassador Vetter, uh, a Nebraskan here, uh, originally from my district, and I, I salute you for your thoughtful approach um, uh, while in the administration and, and since. And uh, I, I think uh, we've We've seen oh, over the years uh, a lot of ebb and flow of trade policy and trade rhetoric, and and uh, um, I, I I don't want to get too aggressive here as as a guest at this uh, at this subcommittee hearing. Fire away, <laughs> Fire away. okay. Uh, but I I hope that we will reward good faith negotiations, good faith discussions uh, that that take place, and. Um, I, I, I don't want to be doubtful of that, uh, that this will take place, but in, in seeing how USMCA has, has uh, been handled uh, of late, I, I guess I'm skeptical. Uh, but I, I hope that, and I will say that given all of the dis uh, trade discussions across America over the last two years, roughly, I think we have an elevated discussion about trade, what trade is, what trade does, what it should do, what it shouldn't do, or, or what it hasn't done, what it has done. Um, so I think discussions across America <clears throat> are, are um, like I said, elevated. And 
there, there are many folks in, in my district, the number one agriculture district in, in America. <laughs> Mr. Arrington doesn't like that, but... Uh, <laughs> right. uh, but they are, are grateful, you know, in, in, a, in a bigger picture of, of the, the various actions taken uh, to help uh, rural America, I think, uh, reduced regulation and regulations and others. And, and they see the importance of USMCA and solidifying that, passing that, as strengthening our position as we, as we face uh, China and the challenges uh, with China that I, I don't talk to anyone who thinks we should do nothing about China. Uh, I, I hope that uh, we can uh, unite together. So here we have Japan. Uh, we, we have some, some great opportunities. I hope we take advantage of those. <laughs> and, and I think as, as good a relationship as our two countries enjoy, uh, that we can address some things now and some other things later. Uh, I, I, I think that can take place. Uh, Mr. Nasser, you mentioned that we rely, we use and rely on good trade agreements. I, I'm, well, I'd be curious to know which trade agreements you would point to as, as most beneficial. Um, what I, what I, I, I don't think I phrased that correctly. What I meant to say was we rely on trade, the actual, you know, the, the flow of commerce back and forth. When I'm talking about our FTAs, we think there's been some uh, uh, critical flaw as far as the uh, really weak, weak labor chapters and other things I, I mentioned. On every FTA, or would there be uh, one FTA that would be better than another? Uh, they're, all, they're all different based on... Would USMCA you know, be better markets? than previous FTAs? The, it has provisions that are better, but I would add that we want to make sure that it actually changes the flow of work from U.S. to Mexico and ends the offshore net we've seen for so long. So there's work to be done still. So in making sure that it does, uh, perhaps we need to let it go into effect. <laughs> with, we lose all leverage. We lose all leverage once we, you know, go into force with this agreement. There's a lot of there's a lot of forces uh, at Mexico at corporations based here that would love the status quo. So um, actually seeing changes on the ground, having an enforceable agreement um, means a lot because we think this is going to be whatever happens here. We're going to have for decades. So we just want to get it right. Do you think labor changes made in Mexico uh, have been made in good faith? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the invitation to participate in the hearing. And um, I find it just sweet justice that I get the microphone last after my colleague challenged a Texan in a bragging match. <clears throat> While our witness, one of our witnesses, is a Texan. Um, but We've got a Nebraska too. So I might as well have my first question. Is Texas the largest ag state in the union, Mr. Benning? <laughs> yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I yield. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in a, on a serious note, and Mr. Benning, you've been a great friend, and I've enjoyed working alongside of you as, uh, to be a voice for agriculture here in our nation's capital. Um, but on a very serious note, um, we have seen a 50% reduction in farm income over the last several years, um, the likes of which we haven't seen since the Great Depression. True or false? That is true, sir. Uh, we're, we're witnessing uh, the highest bankruptcy rates in recent history. True or false? That's true. Here's one that just will rattle your soul. Farmers and ranchers have the highest suicide rate in the nation five times the national average. Are times tough in ag country, Mr. Benning? Yes, sir, they are. You know, I'm reminded of a famous quote from, a, uh, from one of our presidents. Farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield. We are... Um, our U.S. beef guys especially, but ag in general, have been bleeding out on account of not having parity and competition in the Japanese market. We would stand to lose over a billion dollars in the next several years had we not shorn up this component on the tariff-related provisions. A billion dollars. This is our largest market for U.S. beef. 
Um, and I think the, the president and the administration, Bob Lighthizer, ought to be commended for understanding the urgency of the matter here. Time was not on our side, and we needed to do a deal, and it's quite frankly a great deal with respect to tariff provisions. It obviously is not a comprehensive uh, trade agreement, and I think everyone in this room and, and all the witnesses would agree that's the long-term goal. But you gotta, you got to be able to survive. It's like being on the operating table in the emergency room. I'd like to know how our bones are going to heal, but I'd just like to stop bleeding out. And that's, I think, what this represents in, in many ways. And I think that's, again, agreed upon by the folks um, here as, as witnesses. Um, we have more cows in West Texas than we than 43 states individually have people. And every time I go back to the district, they tell me those cows, how bad the Green New Deal is. That's a joke, Mr. Benning. You can, you can laugh. But we've talked about the framework for rural po prosperity, you and I both. Freer markets, fairer trade, a stronger and more reliable safety net, and sustainable infrastructure for small town USA. We've got lower taxes and lower regulatory burdens. The tax reform was pro-ag, whether it was 100% expensing or the death tax exemption raised. Um, the farm bill, bipartisan, and I give Colin Peterson a big thumbs up uh, for being willing to work and, and compromise to help uh, the, the producers in this country with a more reliable and responsible safety net. Um, we need more markets. We need more customers. And uh, we need to move on, quite frankly, from our existing trade relationships and go after new markets and new customers. And USMCA, as you said, uh, Ms. Vetter, that these things build on each other. That's why it's important to get the best deal you can. Well, we have this comprehensive trade deal just waiting in the wings to be implemented. And it's not going to be perfect, but we all agree it needs to be enforced. Uh, and it is a game changer. 170,000 new jobs for this great country. But, but more importantly, and I'd like to just tee it up for everybody to comment, but Mr. Benning, you could start. Not, um, not in the last five seconds. It's in, yes, sir. May I just put a, put a little fine point here on my comment? And they don't have to respond. That's good, because your time's up. The answer is no. No, no put a fine point okay. on it. You're a guest. It, it, it's, thank you. It, it's the fact that it's, it's not just for the Mexico-Canada markets. It's the framework to move with greater speed than we've been moving for opening up new markets. I think that is why it's more profound than just simply a better deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I must say, uh, I, I need to interject for a, a second, Mr. Arrington. Uh, uh, Mr. Panetta would have corrected you. California is the largest <laughs> agricultural producing state. Now, Texas may well get more subsidies. You get far more than California, uh, but uh, Texas uh, is highly ranked in a number of areas, but you're not the largest agricultural state, and I do think you're the largest re recipient of subsidies. Um, with that, let me thank our witnesses. We deeply appreciate your taking all this time with us today. We appreciate the committee members and guests to join in the conversation, and we look forward to continuing it in the future. Thank you very much. This was very helpful. We're adjourned.